have me. Um, I'm, my name is Sarah McEwen. At the moment, I work at the University of Dundee. I've been there for a year now um, with the community education team, which I'm really enjoying. And I'd like to say that in our undergraduate programme, we've got a range of ages of learners who are, are doing their community education um, degree at the moment. Prior to working at the university, I worked for 19 years in local communities in Dundee and doing a variety of different roles within that time. I worked at Dundee City Council, um, but my, my job changed through those years. I didn't intend to be there for 19 years, but that's what happened. Um, I think we from that role, but I must be. Um, I started off as a sessional youth worker and um, progressed through into youth literacy's work, which then led me into adult learning. It wasn't somewhere I intended to go because youth work was always my passion, but that is where um, my career journey went. <coughs> and I'm glad of that. I was having a wee look, so, uh, you know, when I was asked to come along talk about the future of literacy in Scotland, I thought to myself, I'm a wee bit out of touch because I've been involved in teaching for the past year. Um, it's it's been at least six years since I was involved in pure literacy work, but um, it's given me the opportunity to, to revisit what I did and have a wee look and see what was it we did then. And it's actually kindled that passion again in myself and a bit links with other people working in the field. And um, when I had a wee, a wee look about research I did in 2003, um, because I know the picture of the landscape was very different when I was involved in literacy's work. I started out doing it in 2003, as I said. Um, and in the introduction of this research, I've noted that the Scottish Executive has allocated funding of £51 million for the period 2001 to 2006 in a national drive to improve literacy in numeracy um, in Scotland. And I thought, that seems, <laughs> that seems unbelievable. Um, and I didn't realise I was quite really qualified. I didn't realise how lucky I was to be working in that in that landscape, you know, <clears throat> with those resources. Um, and it wasn't just about the, the money that was available then. <clears throat> there was a lot of money, but there was also a political will. Literacy was high on the agenda. You know, it was, it was high on the agenda nationally and locally within local authorities. Um, I think Jim made reference to it. And there was a real passion and a, you felt like you were on the leading edge. You know, there was money there to really uh, take creative approaches to the work we were doing. The funding was there, the ideas were there, the passion was there. I think a lot of that's still there, apart from maybe the money. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I've probably spoken about some of this, but just to say what my passions are, who I am. Um, I'm very passionate about animals, some of you and yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, as the dog Maxie there, um, I love beaches and I feel passionate about social justice, especially in terms of inequalities um, and inequalities relating to which many relate to literacy. Um, I see inequalities on a daily basis where I live in Dundee, it's been long for the past 10 years, um, but also in our wider society, you know, in Scotland. Um, and then the funny mass is a nod towards creativity and arts, which I'm also very passionate about. And I think the work we do, we have to bring that in because you know we haven't we haven't found the solutions yet. So we need to keep coming up with creative ways of doing things um, and working with people and involving people. So yeah, I said a bit about that, the, the work I was doing. I was really lucky at the time because Certain people came together, there was myself as a youth worker with a little bit of knowledge and some money in my back pocket and um, we were able to, to work and pay for resources and other workers. So I worked in a, a small team of people, a poet, community arts worker and a DJ and the four of us created a lot of teams and said, how are we going to, how are we going to do this work? We're not sure but let's. Let's talk to as many uh, young people and young adults as we can, and let's try as many different things and uh, approaches as we can. And I must say, we put quite a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into that work 
been well, it was one of the most rewarding um, days in my career. Um, I'm not, I could talk about that all day, but I know we've only got 15 minutes. So I wouldn't talk about it for too long, but what I think about it long enough, pass them around. It's just an example of some of the, the work we did. Um, this was a little book of poems that was produced by a group we were working with of young people in Dundee who were fighting against child exploitation. And we worked with them for about six months. Initially, it was difficult to get much response from them, so we've taken a traditional communication route of just talking and asking questions. Um, didn't, didn't really feel very much. We did a bit of music, we did a bit of art, and we brought in poetry, and it, it really took off. And you can see by some of the materials in the books how much the young people express themselves through that medium. That in reading one poem, you could find out more about a young person's life, their, you know, their needs, their joy, their pain, than maybe months of of talking and questioning they might have <laughs> revealed. Maybe I'll pass these ready for a second. Maybe look and pass that out. I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, there's more ways to express ourselves than the kind of traditional dominant ways that we see buttresses within our society. Um, and for me, buttresses has always been about voice and not not just about not just about being able to speak and be heard, but also that knowledge that what you've got to say is valuable. Um, even if it doesn't fit in with the norm and the dominant kind of way that we communicate and express ourselves, you still have something very valuable to contribute. about me. What uh, does in Scotland today? Um, what does it look like? What does it look like? Is it is the future for what you say is bleak or bright? I know that's a bit like but let's go with that for starters. Um, who thinks it's bleak? Who's overall feeling is it's bleak? Okay, small show. You're in the minority, that's all right. You're allowed to be, that's great. <laughs> Uh, what about Brian? <laughs> Sitting on the fence and that's too binary. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, so we'll have to read it out because as I said, I didn't know really, my finger was quite on the pulse with it. I thought, what is actually happening? Um, I know in Dundee um, that there's still a dedicated team of literacy workers within our adult learning within the communities department of the city council. So I knew that was happening in Dundee, but I also knew that that wasn't across the board, and that was probably quite unique um, for that protected team to still be there doing very much doing um, literacy's work and only literacy's work. Um, so I had to be, had to be sort of um, ask around to see what other people were doing, and um, find that there are still. There are still much of these workers out there, and some of you have put up your hands and identified yourself today. Um, not everybody's working in that traditional if you're a dedicated much of these workers, so often it's been merged into a more generic role, you're doing other work, but it's still there. That was good to see. Um, I only really am speaking about Tayside and Fife for that, because that's that's what I know, that's my, my area. Um, <coughs> I'd like to explore this further, but for now that's um, that's the scope. But I did speak to um, there is a person in Education Scotland with a bunch of these remit, Laura McIntosh. So I had a quick conversation with her, and she had um, informed me that the, the CLD Adult Literacies Network has been re-established, um, and by Education Scotland, and that got 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 mainly managers from local authorities together to talk about what people were doing across Scotland. So that's been really established. But also she said it was quite a good healthy representation from across Scotland at that. So that gave me a little bit of hope in my heart that you know that's still there on the agenda for certainly within local authorities and within uh, managers. Um, as far as getting a map of what's happening across Scotland, I don't know if where we could get that, I had a few conversations with people, um, but the, the CLD Standards Council are as part of their re-registration process, which they're introducing 
We will be asking people what their, their job title is, but also what the role the role is. So I think that might give us in the future a little bit of a picture of who's doing the work. Obviously, you'd have to be a member of the so to get that, but that could you know it could help to build a bit of a picture. The main thing for me is that that work it's still going on. People are still out there; they're doing it. It's not; it doesn't appear in all the sort of uh, community plans. Which is, isn't always mentioned in our own Dundee, the workers are saying we've not got any mention of registries or learning particularly within that plan, which is a little bit concerning, but for now they're still there. Um, so just a few other things to consider is like where are we? You know, there was all that money and um, that millions of pounds poured into uh, literacy work in the early 2000s. But where are we now? Have we solved it? You know, is that as everyone in Scotland watch it and Change the face of um, Russia's in Scotland. I don't think so. Um, the, the Scottish Survey of Adult Literacies in 2009 identified that 26.7% of um, adults in Scotland may face occasional challenges with uh, their functional literacy skills. We don't have an update on that, but I just have a look at. Um, a report, the Curriculum for Excellence Level Report, <coughs> that's produced by the Scottish Government, and they've now, it's now based on teachers' professional judgments about the stage that uh, young people are at in terms of their, um, their progress, reaching up at attainment stages, um, it, and this is from the P7, P7 for professional judgment um, from the teachers. This report was produced last December, so for 2017 to 2018. As you can see from that, um, the teachers were saying across Scotland that 73% were ready in terms of writing and 79% in terms of their reading. So that still leaves us at <coughs> almost a third. Um, we're not being judged as being functionally literate or um, are falling behind. So I would ask you to think about, you know, what does that mean? What does that mean if you're in that, that third or that 20% that aren't reaching those stages? What if you're, at the, you're one of the 26% who's facing occasional challenges with have literacy? What does that mean in terms of your everyday life? Um, I would say you're then at the risk of being shut out from parts of society or um, <coughs> being left behind altogether. Um, it doesn't, I think when it says occasional challenges, maybe it doesn't quite tell us how, what that actually means. Maybe it doesn't quite capture the seriousness of that, if that's in your own life and you can't navigate a part of society or, or feel included within it. I'm just else to back up <laughs> And I like the remarks. So that's... Which one's which? That's it's Dundee to you. No Glasgow to be, but I'm going to make Dundee the big one. Um, <laughs> I want Dundee because that's what I'm at. I mean, Glasgow for the end of the day. Um, that's the Scottish Index multiple deprivation 2016 maps. I've just brought the ones related to um, education. So you can't really see it, what it says in the text, but the, the, the darker red spots, patches, are the data zones with the the highest, 20% highest deprivation in terms of education. And you can see what that means, uh, what those indicators are. So, for example, um, working age people can make qualifications. Um, proportion of young people not in full time education, when they're training, and proportion of them. So, I think that um, Dundee. There's 71 data zones that are in the 20% highest deprivation, and the last one is 318. Um, some things to think about when you're going to have your discussion. Um, what, you know, how do we look at what the, what the statistics are telling us? What the workers out in the field are telling us in terms of maybe it's what just these work is still there. But what is happening? Um, what's the kind of wider picture? You know, the world that we're living in is different today than it was 
you know, a couple of years ago. So, um, just a few things, I'm not going to go into them in huge detail, but things to think about. And one of the ones is, uh, a major one, I think, is the online world, the kind of Facebook society we're <laughs> kind of moving towards, um, where it's really difficult to actually speak to a person when you're trying to access services or just go about your kind of day to day living. Um, and more and more, the, the kind of pushes for everything to be online and to be digital. I'm not against online, <laughs> and I don't know if I'm a because um, I just think you can't even. You know, you, you can't replace the what you get from calling together and having that connection with people and speaking to people. And if you struggle, if you're struggling to navigate in the world, making things online and not having somebody you can just speak to is produces a whole another set of challenges, a new set of challenges. So thinking about that landscape we're in. And I think there's a bit of an assumption that everyone's got a, a mobile phone or a smartphone or, a, or even the internet access, and you know, everybody doesn't. Um, you know, I think the, the language and the narrative has that everybody does <coughs> sometimes. So. Also, another thing that came up with us speaking to people was um, in ESOL work and work with Syrian refugees and people coming for ESOL support and then it becoming apparent that they, they're not literate in their own first language. So how, what, and the ESOL, often times the ESOL tutors or workers aren't quite sure how to deal with that because they they can teach English but they're not sure how to be tackle the literacy uh, part of it. Um, and I'm kind of just that. The employability agenda, which is a big agenda and um, how does that you know, what, what relevance has that got to uh, literacies and um, you know, what kind of jobs are you getting, maybe getting pointed for or pushed into instead of maybe having the opportunity to, to express yourself or address some of these, these skills. And the skills and demands, I'm thinking about all the demands from the world and the skills of um, the workforce or people who are, are, are working in um, Within local communities, have we adapted our skills to meet the demands that people are coming forward with? But also with the changing, the changing demands, but also with the aging workforce and people who might have been around where there was a lot of um, training um, for people when there was money about, are they going to leave and retire? Hopefully they'll volunteer and come back and still work within communities, but are we potentially going to lose some of those skills? How do, we, how do we transfer that? Make sure that knowledge gets transferred. Welfare reform, another huge um, policy, um, and the impact of welfare reform within our local communities and the tasks it's putting on people, the nature, different nature of tasks that people have to navigate in order to get money and um, possibly. Signing up for things you don't understand, but they're certainly not your own because you have first hand experience of this. Well, yeah, the employment officer are making people sign up for Twitter, for instance. What? Sorry. <laughs> really? Uh, to look for jobs? To look for jobs. Yeah. I was thinking about the conditionality agreements as well, that people sign and maybe don't realise what they're signing to agree to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which we see more and more. And I just, when I was looking at this research, this is from 2003, but I thought it was quite good. Um, one of the guys I spoke to, he was an 18 year old, um, 18 year old male. I was just asking about where might we find, come up against those occasional difficulties, those challenging um, daily activities. And he, he said to me all the time, he didn't like when I get a letter from the social. That's it. Yeah. Um, like when I get a letter from the social, that really hurts me. I don't understand the line of the social. It's still so relevant. I don't understand that. Yeah. It's deliberate. It's deliberate. So, but that's you know that's having a major impact on people living in our communities. Um, I was like, what about resources? I think books. Though. I think that's a big. Money resource issue <laughs> that we need to think about. Is there going to be money? It's good to see that there are there is still work going on 
despite the cuts in austerity and um, what's happening in the forest, I don't know. But just a quick research there because um, this is, for me, I thought, I really want to know now. I know a little bit, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Now I want to know more of what is, you know, what is, what does the future of um, Rochester's in Scotland look like? So I'm making that a uh, mission amongst other things over the next few while to have to look into that in more, more detail and speak to people. So if anybody's interested in being involved in that or speaking to me some more, that would be great. Come and see me at some point during the day. And then we can have a chat about that. <coughs> and the other thing is that's just for me that's what is about. And keeping that in mind that it's about that is about connection, it is about belonging, um, it's about navigating the world the world you live in, and it's about your voice. Thanks. <laughs>